Ah, uh, the question as old as YouTube itself. How much theory do I actually need to start composing music? Now, this is a YouTube theory video, so I do feel obligated to play at least one complex chord while giving it an elaborate name that you don't understand and isn't super helpful to you in any way. Uh, clearly an A-flat 9 add to over C. You're welcome. Now you know music. I've spent a lot of time on this channel talking about compositional concepts that I feel are somewhat timeless and can help your music stand out amongst the crowd of trend chasers today. Went so far as to write a free guide about such topics, as a matter of fact. What I don't talk much about is music theory because it's well covered in this space, even though it often gets conflated with composition, and I feel like they're two totally separate processes. However, recently someone pointed out that due to my background in classical piano, I probably use a lot of theory concepts sort of subconsciously without even thinking about them, and I think that's an absolutely valid point. So I spent some time thinking about them. More specifically, which aspects of music theory I use on a daily basis as a composer and artist, even if I don't conscientiously realize that I'm using them at the time. Much to my surprise, even after having all that theory background, when I sat down to write something, I felt sort of just as paralyzed as I imagine someone with no theory at all might feel. If you're a total beginner and have no theory background, you're probably just overwhelmed at where to even begin. There's just so much information to learn. And on the other side of the spectrum, if you've studied theory but not how to apply it to a creative process, you're probably struggling with analysis paralysis. That was certainly the case for me. I had learned a bunch of names of things and rules, but really no idea why they were there in the first place or how to actually use them to make stuff. Well, I'm gonna try to help both groups out today and you won't even need an advanced degree or my super secret chord formula that only the pros use. And you may actually be surprised at how simple some of them are. So during the process of editing this video, I'm beginning to realize that I sort of Tarantino'd it. I basically start off with some of the most beneficial concepts, and then at the end of the video, I show you a way that you can sort of develop all of them at once. And as much as I would like to claim that that is an act of genius YouTube strategy, clearly the fact that I'm having to add this video after the fact is evidence that I'm just not that smart. But either way, I think you'll benefit the most through sticking around to the end of this video. We tend to make the mistake of lumping all music theory into one category. And then we take composition and we lump it in there with it. Then half the internet thinks that learning the circle of fists will transform them magically into a master composer somehow. And then the other half declares that all theory must be bad and stifles their creativity. Today, let's see if we can create some clarity and break down theory into two distinct categories. Theory concepts usually serve one of two functions. They're either grammatical or they're analytical. If we were to think of music like a language, the grammatical aspects of theory would be the foundational things like note names, chords, scales, key areas, basic rhythms, meter, and a bunch more. These are just basic tools and building blocks. They will not harm your creativity like I see so many people worried about on the internet, just like learning about them will not magically turn you into a composer. They're simple fundamentals that will be helpful for most of you and won't be necessary for others. I'm sure there have been great fiction writers that can still tell a tremendous story without ever knowing exactly what subject-verb agreement means. They intuitively have that skill and ability. But let's be careful in assuming that something is categorically, universally unhelpful just because we have a few examples of exceptionally talented people who can get by without it. In the analytical side of theory, we learn about how music is put together and how certain things function. I actually think that can be incredibly useful for composers as well, but it's also the part that can become like a fetish almost for theorists. And at some point it goes beyond being useful for a composer. This obsession with naming every chord or figuring out the function of every single thing, a lot of it just isn't necessary in the creative process. It's analytical. This is also where I got a bit lost in the weeds studying theory without studying composition. I didn't know how to apply these things. So rather than arbitrarily naming a bunch of complex chords that make me sound really smart, I want to focus on the more practical and useful aspects of this analytical style of theory. The kind of analysis that I found most helpful in writing my own music. 
One of the best ways to overcome creative overwhelm is to work within some kind of a structure. And in music, we call that structure form. I think one of the most helpful ways to really understand form is to learn to identify it in existing pieces of music or songs or tracks or whatever you're into and see how those things were put together. Almost every piece has sections and those sections usually break down into even smaller sections. We can see a quick example of that here in that guide that I was telling you about earlier. A common example is song form in which you might have a verse and then a chorus and then a verse and then a chorus. <laughs> Time spent looking for a better place It's not out there You could never make it anyway It's for the chosen preordained Why'd you have to throw it all away? Asking questions Another example might be sonata form, in which there's an A section with two distinctive themes, a B section where those themes get fragmented and jumbled up and developed, and then the A section that comes back and kind of ties everything together. probably somewhat familiar with three-act structure or four-act structure in narrative storytelling. And your favorite film, regardless of how edgy and experimental it may seem, probably follows some variation of this structure. Your favorite filmmakers just find ways to be creative within that structure. To push boundaries, you have to have boundaries to begin with. But what if you're having a little trouble distinguishing one section from another? figuring out what constitutes a section. Well, you might need just a little bit of... Now, I'm just scratching the surface here on ear training, but I would focus on two things that will help you identify form. Learn to identify the roots of chords. That's kind of the home base note for each chord. And once you've done that, you're able to determine which of those chords kind of sounds like home within a given section. And what sounds like home is probably what key you're in. You can often look at the first chord, the last chord, and which chord happens most frequently throughout a section to determine this. Learn to identify intervals, and that's just the distance between notes. This helps you understand more about the relationships between two chords once you've been able to identify the roots. This also helps you understand the relationship between two key areas. Another benefit of interval training is being able to sort of pick out those melodies that always seem to come to you in the shower and <laughs> notate them later on. If you do take anything from this video though, I think it would be that you shouldn't get too caught up on naming things. It doesn't really matter which key or which mode you're in as long as you can tell that it's a new key area from where we've been and that it works well with where we've been and where we're going. Everything is contextual. This is not the common practice period anymore, so you don't have to stay within one key or one mode for the entire duration of a given section or even a given phrase. In fact, one of my favorite things to explore is finding interesting chords that lie outside of the key area. those fresh harmonic changes. You might call them borrowed chords, you might call them substitutions if you're a jazz player. It's all kind of the same thing. Now all of this seems kind of abstract right now because we're just kind of pulling all of this out of thin air. But what if I told you that there's a super secret way that we can visualize all these things like key areas and scales and chords and well you're not gonna believe this but 
You absolutely don't need to be a virtuoso. You just need enough basic skills to improvise and give yourself a starting point. Now, the reason I'm using the keyboard here is not just because it's my primary instrument, it's also because it's one of the easiest ways to visualize these theory concepts. It's also become universally accepted in the producer world. I don't know if you've ever turned a MIDI roll on its side before, but it's a keyboard. So if you can play in enough to give you a starting point and then you can visualize it in that MIDI roll, you can start to edit it, which is part of the compositional process. But where on earth do you start? Piano is hard and we only have a certain amount of time left before the AI singularity comes and replaces us all anyway. Well, let me make it easy for you. Start with scales, chords, inversions, and arpeggios. Yeah, the boring stuff. But you know, the thing about the boring stuff is it will usually get you where you want to go faster than wasting time looking for quick tips so that you don't have to do the boring stuff. I mentioned this in my YouTube community and got an excellent question from Michael. Shout out to Michael because he's awesome and always leaves very thoughtful comments. And he asked, why bother practicing scales and chords and arpeggios when we don't actually see literally scales, chords, and arpeggios much in music? And it really has a couple of benefits. From a technical keyboard standpoint, it gives you conventional fingerings that you can quickly recall when you see similar passages in music. Even though they may be altered somewhat, you kind of know where to start. You've built it into the muscle memory. And from a theory perspective, it helps you learn and visualize all of these other things that we talk about. Key signatures, chords, all of it. Now this doesn't sound like a TikTokable shortcut, and that's because it's not. But it also isn't magic. It's doable for anyone. It's literally just a matter of putting in some repetitions. And it seems like a small price to pay to be able to do the things that you want to do. Once you get to the point where you can improvise a little bit and identify a form and structure that you can then decorate with your own ideas as a kind of model, find some way to capture those ideas, whether that be with pencil and paper or with MIDI roll, which we've already talked about. And since we've learned a little bit of ear training at this point, you could even sing something into your voice memos on your phone and capture it later. And once you have a little snippet to work with, work with it. This is where the compositional process really begins. It's all trial and error. That's the secret. Even the greatest compositions of all time did not float down on a cloud ready-made. They went through iterations, they went through drafts, they were refined after a number of experiments. And the act of writing down an idea is in and of itself kind of a self-editing process. You will have to think through things more clearly as you write them down and you'll make adjustments and changes. It's the same as recording a voice memo versus writing a paragraph. You have to think it through more carefully. It allows you to slow down and actually consider what you're doing. To go into more detail, like once you have a chord progression, starting to consider how each note of each chord moves to the next note in the next chord. So now we're starting to think about chord progressions as linear rather than just a series of blocked vertical chords. And if you want to know more about what in the world that means, you can check out this video right here, in which I talk all about that. 